We are in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're looking at verses 7 through 16. Lord, uh, <clears throat> thank you again for your word that you have given to us, and we ask that uh, you would continue to have your way in our lives and in this fellowship. We ask for your blessing, for your empowerment, for your presence to accomplish your will because we couldn't do it otherwise. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of the message is Body Ministry. And, um, and so we, you know, it figures because we've been studying, again, the first three chapters here in the book of Ephesians. And uh, we have been called upon to serve one another. And, um, you know, Jesus, he said to us, to the church in John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so there'll be no doubt as we love one another, who we belong to. And it's going to be so foreign, God's love in us, that it really will be us making a statement as we serve Jesus Christ and we follow his example. And um, I had written down all the different places where it mentions one another in regards to the body of Christ to love one another honor one another, be kindly affectionate to one another, receive one another, admonish one another, salute one another. You're members of one another. Have the same mind toward one another. Greet one another, not to be puffed up against one another. Have the same care one for another. Serve one another be forbearing one to another, be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, submitting to one another, lie not to one another, comfort one another, edify one another, not preferring one before the other, exhort one another, consider one another, speak no evil toward one another, grudge not one another, Confess your faults to one another. Pray for one another. Have compassion for one another. Use hospitality for one another. Minister to one another. That's what I came up with in about five minutes, looking through the scriptures. And it's a tall order for sure that only God can fill. He's the only one that can do that work, and it's by his spirit, and it is body ministry. It all, it all adds up, and we are to be uh, contributing factors to those things that God would be doing regarding that. And so, you know, this is worked out in many ways, and I would only say don't miss it. Because many times it comes with challenges, body ministry. It, doesn't, it isn't so easily. It's just like our homes and our families. And, and it's just, it, you know, it comes oftentimes with challenges. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 27 that as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And so, you know, and that's so true, but when I thought, when I think a little deeper on that scripture, I think, yeah, it was sharpened, that's true. Iron sharpens iron, but it has to be the right angle. Otherwise, it does nothing if they just beat against each other. The right angle would be the right motive that we would have, that we would have a good intention. And in the iron sharpening iron that God would work, it also tells us that regarding oxen, if there's no oxen, 
that the stall is clean. But much strength comes from the work of the oxen. Much increase comes by the strength of the ox. That word there uh, where it says the trough is a word that can be translated crib, which in the, new, in the King James, but also stall, which in context would be saying if, if there's no ox in there, you're not going to be stepping on any cow pies anywhere. But unless you have them, you're not going to get the work done. And it points to us in, in that sense. Yeah, sometimes it could get messy, but it's important. And then also, it tells us that, you know, a brother is born for adversity. And so through the difficult times that we would have to endure in body ministry. So don't miss it. Don't miss it. God works. It's a work. It's a work. Could be a struggle. Um, just like, you know, if you ever hear uh, good marriages take lots of work. It's the same idea. But within the church, the building of the church. And so in those first three chapters, it really laid the groundwork for the next three chapters. And a good theme, theme first that I chose was that, that we're, ex, in, in Ephesians 1, 6, it says, uh, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. We are accepted in the beloved. And as we studied, we, find, we realize it's a done deal. It's something that Jesus Christ accomplished on our behalf, and it's concerning our great salvation. And so all that we've been studying through those three chapters, a total of 16 studies, we saw that validation to that truth that we have been accepted in the Beloved, our identity in Christ. And those three chapters spell that out made that clear, laid the foundation underneath us that allows us to move forward with that understanding. It built that rock-solid foundation, that fortress that we have. And, you know, it tells us in, in Psalm 40, it says there, he also brought me out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and has set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. That word there, establish my steps, means that he made me stable, fixed, and firm. And so this is what God has done to lay that foundation underneath us. So we're no longer to be unstable due to our rocky past. That has been done away with. Rather, to be securely planted in a solid rock relationship because of this truth that has been given to us. Now we know that we know where we stand in Christ, and so we're able to, to stand firm, secure, solid, and so these next three chapters, chapters four through six, teach, teaches us that we are given basically a proving ground where all this is to be worked out, given a time and a place to show our appreciation for all that the Lord has done for us. And it comes with a proposed itinerary, how we are to live our lives with the pilgrim road map of possibilities that God has given, that God has laid out for us. And so we just have to be willing to travel that way because he gives us free will to travel that way. The trip bought and paid for and financed by Jesus Christ, and it is true. It's who you know. It is true. That's a true statement. In this life, it, it is who you know. 
And if you know Jesus Christ, then you got it made. You got it made. And you can be confident and secure. And so there in verse 7, we see it says, Paul writes, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Each one of us. The scripture tells us that none of us are lacking that grace given by the gifting of God. As a matter of fact, it's verified in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all, for the benefit. What you've been given is for the whole, the profit of everyone else in the church to benefit everybody else, to encourage everyone else, to strengthen everyone else. That's why that gifting has been given. And it's by God's grace, unmerited favor. Now, to varying degrees, uh, we've been given that grace. And this, relating, relating to giftings, it varies. Now, the grace given related to salvation is the same for all of us. But the context here is related to the giftings that we've been given. Notice it's according as it relates to your gifting. This grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so we've been gifted by the grace of God to share our giftings, <clears throat> in that capacity that God has given to us. Not to compare my gifting with somebody else's gifting, but to be true with the gifting that God has given me. He knows what I can handle, and we need to be responsible with that. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, now this he ascended... What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And so the question that's often asked me is, how can you be in God's presence after you die and yet be waiting for the resurrection. And of course, the answer is, and it tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, where it says, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. And so we're confident by the promise of God that when we're absent from this body, that we will be present with the Lord. And so when we think of that, we're talking about the physical body that's going to be resurrected on resurrection day. Now your spirit goes to be with the Lord when we're vacating this, this body, the, the tent. The Bible calls this body a tent, second Corinthians 5, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And so there, we know that when we're in this tent, when you think of tent, you think of temporary, right? right? We know that this tent is wearing thin is weakening, wearing out. You know, it's not hard to see that. It doesn't take much imagination. A good mirror, you're good. You know, you can see it. It's wearing out. And yet, God has prepared for us uh, another place. And we know also that our spirit is ushered into God's presence when we're out of here unless the rapture comes first. If the rapture happens first, which I'm looking for, 
as a soon coming event. Yeah, you too? I'm glad. That's two of us. Three? Four? Yeah. yeah. I know. I know. Most of you would just all raise your hands. We're looking for that rapture. Well, you know, if the rapture comes first, then guess what? We're going to be immediately transformed into our glorified bodies and catching up with those that are already in the clouds with Jesus Christ, all in the twinkling of an eye. In other words, it's not even a measurable amount of time that that will happen. And, you know, it tells us that in 1 Thessalonians 4, where it says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. So, you know, we're supposed to be in the know concerning these things. Um, Those who have, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, died previously, lest you sorrow as others have uh, no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so we comfort one another by reminding one another with words and displaying how we feel with our actions. And so we comfort one another. And so even in our actions, we're confident knowing that the Lord's going to come back. And so it, you know, it really, you know, has an effect on the way we live. And so it's being confident in that way. And so a footnote to these physical bodies being resurrected is questions have been asked me as well as, well, should you be buried? Should you be incinerated should you you know and all that (laughs) I would say well I mean it really doesn't matter because either way wherever all your elements are at that time it's all coming together the Lord doesn't lose track of anything did you know that there's been believers incinerated by nuclear weaponry there's been believers buried at sea who knows what happened to those bodies You know, one fish takes a bite out here and another fish takes a bite out there and then they swim in two different directions, you know. God keeps track of it all. But on that resurrection day, your physical body, just as when we look at Jesus Christ when he was in the tomb, three days later, he rose. The tomb was empty. The components of his physical body was raised into his glorified body. The same thing is going to happen to us. And so... When Jesus, and it tells us there, when Jesus died, he first ascended there in verse 9 to the lower parts of the earth. So Jesus paid that price of redemption, and then when he went down, he met with those in waiting. Because until Jesus Christ, who was the, f- the first fruits of the resurrection, was to be resurrect- resurrected and in heaven, the spirits that died in faith went into the lower parts of the earth, a place called Hades, two compartments. One compartment was for those that were waiting for the resurrection, uh, the others into a not a good place, waiting for judgment. And so Jesus went, met with them, and then it says when he ascended, he led captivity captive. And so he set them free, and then their spirits were in the presence of the Lord, awaiting now their long, you know, dead bodies at the resurrection. They'll be rejoined, but they'll be the first ones to be rejoined before those who are still kicking join them in the clouds. And so, 
There was also an amazing event when Jesus had raised. We see that in Matthew 27, where it says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This is when Jesus breathed his last and said it was finished, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. They call that a a token resurrection, which it was just the evidence of that God defeated that last enemy of death. And can you imagine, you know, Uncle Greedo died, you know, 10 years ago, and then all of a sudden he comes knocking on the door. (laughs) Hey, how's it going? (laughs) What? That would be crazy. And so they're just walking around right there saying, hey, remember me? You know, I was dead, but now I live. And And so we have... That described there in verse in, in through eight through ten, so we have um, you know that the lower parts of the earth, that place. If you re- want to read late, later Luke sixteen, it really describes that place. But look at verse eleven, and and he Jesus himself gave some uh, to be apostles some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so you have varying gifts given there. The apostles would be delegates, uh, those that are sent in the name of the Lord. Uh, Today they might be best described as missionaries those that go forth and bring the word. Uh, These wouldn't be speaking of the 12 apostles who had a unique calling and a unique work, but the gifting of apostle was as a delegate, as uh, a messenger, as one sent. And prophets, those that would speak God's word are the prophets. And evangelist, a very unique gifting of those who, you know, we all have trace elements of these things, especially they come on, they come off, you know. But then the gifted evangelist that has, has his whole heart, his whole life is given to wanting to get the gospel message out and takes advantage of that and rarely misses opportunity. That kind of guy, he's the evangelist. God calls some to do that, um, and, uh, and so it takes a, a bold individual for all these callings, actually. And some pastors, that would be an under-shepherd, uh, a manager, uh, one who would direct the body of Christ. And often linked with pastor is teacher. A pastor-teacher, a pastor should be a teacher. It's the same requirements of elders, apt to teach And so they're connected, but there's also just the gift of teaching. And like, we're blessed to have so many uh, teachers in the children's church. They say if you can can teach a child, you can teach anybody. And and so, um, you know, and so we have gifted teachers. And so able to communicate so that the little ones can grasp the truth of God's word and it sets that foundation in, in, in their life. And so we're, you know, we're set up as a church that our little ones learn to go through the word as well at their level. Uh, but the understanding that we teach the word of God. And so setting that foundation at a very young age so that you know they hear so many lies all week and when they come here they need to hear the truth and to hear from the Lord and so these giftings mentioned here besides many other giftings that are given to the church but the ones mentioned here it 
in verse 12 says, it's for the equipping of the saints. And so that's our end goal that we are furnishing the church for the finishing work that God has for us, for the work of the ministry. And so it's for the idea of taking care of the things of the Lord. Service rendered to God is what that's speaking of, for the edifying, for the building up of one another, so that we help each other to grow. And so that's our purpose, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. Now, that's not gonna happen until we get to heaven, but that's our goal until, and it says the Son of God, to a perfect man. So the idea is that work continues and we continue to build up the body and um, work accordingly. Each church can be at a different place of maturity for sure. And I think that that's gonna be based on whether it's you're teaching through the word or not because that's how we're gonna mature as believers as we learn the word. If uh, a church is more geared towards, you know, just um, getting, getting everybody worked up and excited and different things and, you know, they may not be as equipped with the word and so oftentimes not able to deal with crisis situation uh, oftentimes being fearful of things. And, you know, so, you know, we need the word because the word delivers us from that fear. The word makes us warriors and soldiers and people who will not uh, just roll over but will stand for the Lord. And so it says, um, to a perfect band, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so we have the Jesus being our standard, Jesus being our example. We follow his example. You know, Jesus said to us in John 13, so when he had washed their feet at, in the upper room, his disciples there, taking his, his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for, you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I missed that one, didn't I? Wash one another's feet. And for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Now, that wouldn't be literally washing one another's feet. It could be, but that's not the idea. The idea that you would take the lowest place of service and serving one another because Jesus Christ did it. And so we follow his example. And his example is the correct example. So be careful when... Your, you know, your pride might get in the way of his good example. That's an issue. You know, that you're up here not willing to do what Jesus Christ was willing to do. And he left the throne of heaven and came down and served. If you're not willing to do that, somewhere on your earthly throne you sit, not willing to go down to that place to serve. That's, that would be an issue. And so that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Now that right there lets us know that there you know, is varying conditions in the church. And that should go without saying. There's children being tossed to and fro. They're still children. Still Christians, but they're being tossed all over the place. But rather in the building and in the encouraging and in the proper use of the giftings, then that doesn't happen or shouldn't happen or rarely happen, whatever the case 
may be, that we would not be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. And so, in other words, one minute the wind's blowing one way and the next minute the wind's blowing the other way. No. When you're following the lead of the Spirit, you're going one way. And you remain going one way because there's only one way. And in that way, we follow the counsel of the Lord, not wanting to go to the right, not wanting to go to the left. But that one way is declared to us through the word, and that's how we're able to stay the course, finish well, and not be tossed around teaching this way then teaching that way and then getting on this kick and then getting on that kick and then when that popular thing dies we go no the word of God never changes you to stay the course the wind changing can spoil everything I was on elk hunt one time probably like the second time I ever bow hunted and it was exciting invigorating and I had a friend that was about 30 yards behind me, 20 yards behind me, bugling, and I'm in a draw. <laughs> and he, he got another, he got a bull to bugle. And then I heard the bull coming up the draw. And then your heart starts pumping, your adrenaline starts going. You're wondering, okay, he, he hits the clearing that's about 15 yards out there. How are you going to pull? What are you going to do? And it's getting, he's getting louder and he's breaking things. And you get nervous, and all of a sudden, I felt the wind hit the back of my neck. And he went silent, and he was gone. Changing of the wind. <laughs> you know, and so, what's my point? Well, the Bible is not to be taught that way. The Bible is not for private interpretation. It means what it means. It says what it says, whether you like it or not. Don't skip any part of it. A uh, pastor should be determined to teach the word of God and not sidestep issues and so forth. And sometimes that can be hard and you put yourself out there, but that's what we do. And because, and it says, carried about with every wind of, of doctrine, that's the idea of, you know, not having to say look what the cat dragged in what is that and you know in the history of the church just even modern history you look at you go, what is that church doing over there are you kidding me really you know and and then you have to shake your head because you know that the lord is there ministering to his people but you have to think how's that affecting people and how some people are going to walk away from the church. Walk away from it because of the circus that they see. And yet, you know, it happens. And I don't need to, to give detail concerning that. But we don't just listen to every wind of doctrine. Because it says, notice, by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So it's a purposed plan among those who want to deceive and so we have to be on guard because the lie is weaponized and trickery means sleight of hand how quickly right in front of your face and the cunning craftiness means false wisdom they're proclaiming something to be true that's not true at all and it's false wisdom and for deceitful plotting, it speaks of being patiently set up and framed by the wrong opinion related to morals, religions, relig religion, and, and actions. Think about that. Delusionary. And the woke movement would qualify as one example. Confusing people who don't know better even bought into it by the most liberal of churches. And it's sad. Pastors apologizing for being white? Really? Yeah. 
homosexual preachers. Really? It's all purposed. Promotion of dozens of genders. Morality and decency flushed down the drain of deception. And it's everywhere. If you don't know the word, it's easy to get deceived. You know, but we do know the word, and so the word teaches us. So they're tricky, they're cunning, they're deceitful. But speaking the truth in love... God's word, things that are true, that we may grow up in all things unto or into him who is the head, Christ, growing in Christ, staying the course. And you know where it says that we may grow up? I've thought in all the years that I've been a believer, that would be 1975, And then the first few years, you know, just attending church, not getting involved too much. And then the more I started getting involved, and then pretty soon into ministry, and then counseling, and then teaching, and all that. And I would think of that statement that we may grow up and think, why don't you grow up? And have to say, shake it off. Because the Lord would say to me, concerning my heart, to be patient, to teach the word of God, not to be like Moses and strike the rock twice because finally I'm just sick and tired of you guys, not getting it. And the Lord says, well, basically he moved on. You're not going in the promised land. Joshua will lead the people. Now, Moses is in heaven for sure. He was a great champion. But in that humanness, he just misrepresented God. I don't want to misrepresent God. Yeah, I mean, I I think those things. I have never said that. But I think that. I've even thought that for myself. Grow up. You know? And... And yet, we have to say, well, how long have we been a Christian? But here's the thing. If you're never taught the word, that may never happen. You may never grow up. Now, because of the work of Jesus Christ, you still end up in heaven. But you just miss out on all the opportunities of body ministry here. And the gift that you've been given usually stays on the shelf collecting dust and by doing that it takes away from the body of Christ it takes away from that tip top shape that we could be in and it hinders and it and it hurts and it's by the word the whole word of God Jesus said but he answered in the wilderness temptation he answered and he said it is written Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, the whole counsel of God. Knowing the written word, that's what Jesus said, and the whole of God's counsel. And so, that we may grow up, and then verse 16 from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And so that's a cause and effect. And each one of us have an input, joint and knit speaks of close-knit, not, it speaks of not distant relatives. And it's the idea of um, opposed to being distanced. And so it speaks of investment. And so although, now notice the church is global, right? 
This here is speaking of the dynamics of how the church can practically fulfill this in a local body. Because you can't be in that place unless you're in proximity of one another. So it talks about us as a body of Christ, able to then be fulfilling what we're reading here. And so it's hard enough to do this when we're in a busy you know, society and all. Uh, but I think that fortunately we're, we're kind of spoiled here because we can be close-knit and we have what they had often in the very small church where people would just gather in each other's kitchens and, and fellowship around the table while they're eating. That was something Jesus did all the time. There's something about eating with somebody and just sitting there talking and so forth. And so we're able to do that, and it's a, a blessing because really we have hospitality plus in this church, and, and really it's a making of disciples through hospitality. And as I've said many times, hospitality is something, I mean, discipleship is something that we're never done being discipled. We don't arrive there's something that we're always learning and always growing closer to Jesus Christ. And so we're to be that, you know, work, working together in that sense. For together by what every joint, every joint. So it means bonded or connected. It's our gifting connecting us. So we don't want to be suffering a torn ACL limping around. No, we want to be together. The more damaged connecting tissue, the weaker the body becomes. And so let's not suffer a disconnect as the family of God. And so I know the leadership in this church really agree that we're uniquely gifted. And we need to take full, you know, advantage of our giftings. And so... God has set for us that table of fellowship. And within that, we really are able to then encourage one another with our giftings. And oftentimes, you might just not realize that you have the gift of encouragement. And you notice it says that every joint supplies. You have to think about a supply line. And you're the driver in that supply line. Don't be like the tankers that are sitting off our coast right now with all these goods but they're not able to come in they, they're dis, <laughs> they're not able to find a, a welcoming place but realize that in any war the key strategy is to cut off the supply line that's always like a number one communications and a supply line and so we all have to decide whether that we're going to be part of the problem or part of the solution and if you choose to be part of the solution, it's going to take effort uh, from your part. That we would be, for the effective working speaks of superhuman working, only by the Spirit of God, that every part does its share. And so I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> this is who we're called to accountability here. So don't just dismiss what we're reading here. We really do, and we're going to miss out if you choose to, to not share your gifting. Um, every part does its share. Speaking of the capacity given to us, however minimal it may appear, we're fulfilling the role, God-given role, and honoring God. It causes growth to the body. Otherwise, we would be stunted. We wouldn't flourish like... God would desire uh, for the end for the edifying um, so we are helping to build and strengthen the church to better accomplish God's will um, and then edifying of itself in love we become the beneficiaries of real love God's love and uh, that's what God does he's looking to bless us and uh, he's going to bless those who are tracking with him the Bible tells us, and God doesn't change, 2 Chronicles 16, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart 
is loyal to him. But then in the sad continuing here, in this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. And so God desires to empower us. And I would say, sign me up. And then he says to Asa, the word came to him. And he got angry when he heard the words of the seer. And he put him in prison. For he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. So he didn't want to hear from God. And he chose rather to silence the man who spoke the word of God. And so he, um, he keeps track of these things. He keeps the measure of these things that we continue to use and the manner in which we use them. That's what Luke 6.38 tells us. Given it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And God keeps perfect books in his house of records. And so we can just jump aboard if you as a Christian or we as a church want to experience all the above and enjoy the benefits of a healthy spiritual body. It's not much different than the physical body. It takes discipline, it takes exercise, and it takes a healthy diet. And so God would have us jump on board and to be more effective in in service to him and the enjoyment of the benefits that come along with that. And so I think we have a blessed church and and so it's just, if anything, a reminder to continue on. Do what you, you're doing. Serve the Lord and uh, be blessed. Amen? All right, let's stand together. If you need prayer today, just come on forward. And uh, there'll be somebody right up here to pray for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Again, Lord, we just want to thank you for the dynamics that are laid out. And help us, Lord, to track with those things that you have for us and I pray that uh, you would uh, continue to fill us to overflowing with your spirit that we might serve you in the power that only comes from you and so work mightily in us and through us Lord and and uh, we ask this in Jesus name and also a reminder there is lunch served downstairs for everybody to go and enjoy and enjoy the, the fellowship and the time together in Jesus' name.